<clears throat> hey everybody, this is Ann Hill, and I'm here talking with John Sulak, who is the author most recently of this book has just come out, The Wizard and the Witch, an oral history of Oberon Zell and Morning Glory. Um, and I've known John for a few years, and I'm so glad that you're here on the Google Hangout. Welcome, John. Thank you, Ann. Thank you for having me here. This is, a, this is an exciting new experience for me. Well, you know, the internet like this, talking to somebody in this way. This is this is great. Hey, welcome to the future of book marketing. <laughs> <laughs> welcome to the modern world. That's right. That's right. So, tell me about this book. I mean, this is I, I so I've known you a long time and for what, 10 years now I've heard I'm working on this book about Oberon and Morning Glory. How yeah. did this project start? Well, my first book was called Modern Pagans, and I interviewed you for that, and that I started working on that in the 1990s, and the book came out in 2001. So I interviewed the Morning Glory and Oberon were then in a group relationship called the Raven Hearts, and I interviewed every one of the Raven Hearts, and I put them together in one section in Modern Pagans. And then when Modern Pagans came out, I talked to Oberon and I said, well, your life's really interesting. We could do a whole book about you. And it just kind of came, you know, took off from there. So that was, you know, so you could say it started in the 1990s, but really we started doing interviews for The Wizard and the Witch probably in 2003. I used some of the previous interviews for that. I interview, interviewed everybody on cassette tape. Can you see this? Uh, cassette yeah. tape. So I've got boxes and boxes of cassette tapes. Uh, I did a couple years of preliminary research where I put together sample chapters, and the sample chapters were very long. I think either one of those sample chapters could have been a book in itself. And then finally we got a publisher, and that was about five or six years ago, and then that started the process of putting the whole book together. The right. book is an oral history. So I interviewed a lot of different people, and each interview sometimes went on for two or three hours, and then I transcribed the interviews, and sometimes the interviews only ended up being like, you know, a paragraph in the final book, but for everybody that's in the book, I had to do an interview like that. I interviewed you. You remember that? I do. Oh, vaguely. I hope I said something. <laughs> well, I interviewed you about Gwitty and Penderwin. Oh, right. That's right. I do remember that. Because at that time, you had a, a music distribution business. Yes, indeed. Right. And the story of Gwyd Gwydion was an important part of the mythology of the Church of All Worlds and about Morning Glory and Oberon. So I wanted to incorporate him into the book. Mm -hmm. The Morning Glory and Oberon, their whole thing is living your myth. You know, it's like the story you tell about yourself, the, story, the, the myths that you, you know, repeat and the myths that you know, you believe in, that affects how your, you know, your life is lived. Mm -hmm. And uh, Gwydion was like a big example of that. Gwydion was basically like the pagan version of Kurt Cobain or Jim Morrison or Amy Winehouse or something. You know, he thought he was going to die young and he did. He just kind of like, you know, was famous for a while and very charismatic and then he just disappeared pretty quickly. Yeah, so that's that's the good news and bad news about living your myth, right? When yeah, you, you got to be careful them. what myth you pick. Yeah. He was conscious of the fact that he was going to die young, you know. The, the myths that he believed in were all these, you know, deities that did what he did. So I wanted to put that in the book as kind of a warning that you you, you got to be careful with these things, right? Well, you know that's true. I mean, not to get too far afield. I mean, I don't. I think probably half of our audience is still wondering who these people are. But oh, you yeah. know, I, I really, I, I, I like this this topic. I've been, I talk about it a lot to to people, and um, I have one friend, a good friend, who's a, a Jungian therapist, has been for years. She's and and you know, she's she's also a pagan and a priestess for a long of long standing, and and you know, her take on women especially who uh, who uh, who take on the mother role or the earth goddess kind of role is that that has something to do with the rates of obesity in in paganism I mean mm -hmm. you know you go to a pagan convention and yeah okay we're all we all you know our bodies are sacred but how many you know show of hands how many people here are 
overweight or diabetic or you know the so so her take on that is that well it's that's part of the problem or the shadow side of living a myth and for Gwydion, yeah, it was the king, you know, was a, he reigns for seven years and then is cut down. And, and he didn't actually get to the point in his life where he was ready to sort of switch myths. And he ended up dying tragically young. Um, so anyway, that's just more yeah. on that. Gwydion died in a, a car accident because he didn't have his seat belt buckled. So I guess he figured, well, if he was going to die young, why bother buckling your seat belt? But if he had buckled his seat belt, he would have lived through the crash. That, yeah. oh, there you go. Well, my book about the yeah, I guess we should talk about Morning Glory yeah, and Oberon, so, right? Well, let's back up. Okay, so the reason that Oberon and Morning Glory are important is because of the Church of All Worlds, which right. is one of these um, homegrown pagan traditions that started. Well, I want you to tell the history of it, but basically, it's been an influential and widespread, if not overly organized uh, you know pagan tradition and really sort of a subculture in the in in paganism in the United States for decades so take why don't you take it from there and sort of fill in some some of the stuff that interested you well I actually first heard about the Church of All Worlds when I was a teenager and I went to a science fiction convention and the Church of All Worlds was at the convention and at that time you know, paganism was still kind of underground, and the way people connected with each other in the pagan community was by publishing fanzines. You had to mimeograph them or Xerox them or do something like that. And the role that was used for these fanzines was science fiction fanzines. So I always thought that paganism came out of science fiction fandom because the Church of All Worlds used this method of communication, putting together these little home published magazines and sending, sending them to each other as a way of you know spreading their ideas so that's how I found out about the Church of All Worlds was through their attendance at science fiction conventions and these little magazines they published mm -hmm. and that was how a lot of other people that were pagans at the time found out about each other was through the magazine that they published and then some other zines were published at the same time the Church of All Worlds had this section and the, they published a zine called the green egg and there they had a letter section in it and anybody that wrote in a letter got it published right. so anybody that had their own little pagan group going could write to them and tell about it and it would get in their magazine and people would know about it so that's how I found out about them I just thought it was a really interesting form of communication it was kind of like the internet really this was way right. before the internet but it was a way of reaching people in other places and getting feedback and uh, you know, being creative, they they wrote articles, and that was also how they developed their their spirituality was by, by connecting with these different people and finding out about different pagan ideas, different traditions, as they're called, things like that. The, the Church of All Worlds, them, you know, in themselves, they they didn't grow to a very large membership, but they were part of a yeah. You said they were kind of a subculture within the pagan community. Is that what you said? Well, and a publishing concern. I mean, I think Green Egg was really for no matter whether you were in the Church of All Worlds or not. Green Egg was the, you know, the magazine of record, right? The yeah. magazine of record. And this all started in the '60s and the '70s. And back then, you know, paganism was just a new thing, and nobody was really sure where it was going or what it was going to be. And so, Church of All Worlds just kind of let everybody have their say. And then it became a little more specialized after that. And at that point, Morning Glory and Oberon went off to live in the woods. And right. when they came back out of the woods 10 years later, things had really changed a lot. And mm -hmm. that's one reason why I think the Church of All Worlds isn't more well known than it is, is because they went off on their own, doing their own thing, rather than trying to, you know, start a, a church that was going to reach a lot of people. They were interested in going off and raising unicorns and living off the land and doing things like that. Yeah, so you've interviewed an um, impressive number of people and I mean I think the other part of why the story is so important, not only did these these, you know, Oberon and Morning Glory, they basically started this new religious movement, um, but they also you know, controversy was no stranger to to either of them, and and you've managed to with with Oberon and Morning Glory's 
understanding and engagement, you've managed to to get a lot of um, critical viewpoints in there too. And so, how did that? How did that? How did you manage that? Like you, okay, you're writing about two very influential but also controversial people, and at the same time, you're getting input in these extensive interviews with any number of people who may or may not still uh, be on friendly terms with the Zells. Well, thank you for bringing that point up. And thank you for noticing it in the book. I am a journalist. You know, I'm not writing this book as a, a, a way to try and like convert people to some religion. I, I, I'm a journalist. The people I acknowledge in the credits for this book were other journalists like Hunter Thompson and uh, Tom Wolf and Legs McNeil. These are other uh, Studs Terkel who wrote right. the book Working. These are journalists that went out and interviewed people and got their stories and then either transcribed the interviews or wrote articles about them. That's basically what I was trying to do with this. So if you you know if you're doing a book of interviews as an objective journalist, you want to interview as many people as you can. You know I wasn't trying to you know promote one set of ideas. I was trying to say okay there was all these different people involved in this and there were a lot of different ways of looking at it. And one of the early ways I pitched the book was about this uh, you know, I used this Japanese movie called Rashomon, you know that movie by Akira Kurosawa with Toshiro Mifune. You know, it's just basically Rashomon is these people sitting around a campfire and each one of them tells the same story from their point of view and it, the story comes out like differently every time. So it's not quite like that, it's more objective than that, but that was what I was, you know, kind of inspired by is just the idea of getting different points of view, getting different perspectives on things. Well, and frankly, I think that's the strength of the book, too. I mean, because there's any number of books. You can go into any bookstore and look at for alternative spirituality or paganism or whatever, and there's all kinds of viewpoints, but there's not a lot of journalism. So there's we've got viewpoints and we've got academic stuff, which is, is sort of spans the gamut of very uh, technical and or uh, to very readable. And I think you've done a great job of making something readable and, and this is a densely packed book I mean how many pages are there and the small type you've got a lot of stuff in here so but you managed to have this in this um, good narrative arc through the whole thing so kudos thank you well I went to film school you know and one thing I learned in film school was you know if you tell a story you gotta have a beginning a middle and an end and each chapter had a beginning a middle and an end and the whole book had to have a beginning, a middle, and an end. I wanted, yes, I wanted there to be a narrative arc. I'm also hoping this book reaches people outside of the pagan community, because it's not written just for pagans. It's an American story. You know, sure. one of my, you know, favorite authors, Tom Wolf, he wrote about you know these classic American individualists. You know, people who just lived the way they wanted to live, and they didn't follow the rules, and they created their own, you know lifestyle and that's what Morning Glory and Oberon did. I just look at them as a story of, it goes back to the pioneer days really you know and they were in a way they were pioneers what they were doing and of course not everybody liked what the pioneers did too. I mean if you're going to be an individualist and create something for yourself outside of the mainstream well not everybody's going to approve of it and mm -hmm. one of the controversies with them is I think that they want people to notice what they're doing. They didn't just say, we're going to disappear and live the way we want, mind our own business. They try and tell the whole world about it. So you know, that's where you get into controversy is, is, you know, they go on TV and they do interviews and, you know, they're really media savvy. Sure. So uh, they're probably more well known than other people are, are maybe doing the same thing just because they've been doing it for so long and they want to kind of take their message to the world, which not all individual, you know, uh, people want to do, you know. Not everybody out there in a subculture wants to be well known. Sometimes they just want to go off and be left alone, which they didn't. Well, it, not everybody has the stomach for it. I mean, I, you know, Oberon and Morning Glory at every gathering I've been to, they're clear, you know where they are in the crowd, <laughs> and that's, that's sort of the role they took on. That's also the role they were comfortable in, and, you know, say what you like about it. They're, that left room for the rest of us to just sort of be more normal, <laughs> you know. <laughs> yes, it's true. Um, they, well, they're also in the polyamory community, and they they've lived in an open marriage since they met. I, I, I say they, 
we should say at this point that Morning Glory passed away last week. Yes, yes. Uh, I, I refer to them as they and what they do and what they don't do. I'll keep doing that, but Morning Glory is sadly no longer doing these things. But for 40 years together they did. And polyamory as a community is growing pretty quickly, especially in places like San Francisco. And that's because 25 years ago, Morning Glory and Oberon had already been in a polyamorous relationship for oh, probably a decade and a half at that point. And before they met each other, they were living that way already individually. So they started going out and talking about polyamory, and they were one of the first couples to get out there and say, this is our lifestyle, these are all of our lovers, this is our, our circle of you know community that we have as polyamorous people. So that's another thing they do is you know they they consider themselves as you know spokespeople for whatever community they're in, and, and that really helped get the polyamorous community going. I think I, I don't know how many polyamorous people in San Francisco know who they are or how they started doing this. I think a lot of people are young and and they come to San Francisco and they hear about polyamory and they just accept it as something that's there waiting for them. They don't know that 25 years ago it was a brand new thing and that Morning Glory and Oberon were some of the first people to go out and talk about it in public. Because mm -hmm. it's hard to you know, get out there in public and talk about some of these things for most people. I mean, if people that have a job or if they've got you know, neighbors in the suburbs or whatever, they can't just go out and you know, be public about these things the way that Morning Glory and Oberon did. Yeah. So now this is, and I'm glad you brought up Morning Glory's passing. That's kind of, it's really the reason that I wanted to wait to do this interview. You and I have been talking yeah. about this for a while, but when she was, you know, she was very ill with cancer. She'd been fighting it for a long time, and I just thought, well, let's, let's just wait. So thanks for mentioning that. Um, now I've, gosh, I've lost my train of thought. Oh, right. Because this is a kind of an interesting point in the long story of the Church of All Worlds. Um, can you, I, I mean, so it, it disbanded after a while, and I yeah. think Oberon was kind of in the middle of that. You want to talk about, like, how how things sort of crumbled and then what's happening now? Do you have any of that piece? Here, I'll give you a brief outline. The Church of All Worlds was started in 1962 when the book Stranger in a Strange Land came out. Because Stranger in a Strange Land was a landmark book about open relationships. It was written as a science fiction book. Here we go back to the science fiction theme again. For a long time, if people wanted to write about an alternative lifestyle, they had to put it in a science fiction book, right? Because you know, that way it wasn't threatening to people. So that's what Stranger in a Strange Land was. It was a science fiction book about uh, polytheism and uh, open relationships and a lot of things that you know became part of the pagan community, but it was first written about as science fiction. So Oberon Zell, who was then Tim Zell, he was a freshman in college, read Stranger in a Strange Land and said, this is a great idea, let's do this for real. So he did, and he started the Church of All Worlds for real, and from 1962 or 3 on, he had a church that involved open relationships and you know, polytheism and lots of other things. And then he graduated from college and moved to St. Louis, and they decided to go public with it. So they were in St. Louis in the late 60s and early 70s, and that's when the Green Egg really was reaching people. Mm -hmm. And Margot Adler, who wrote Drawing Down the Moon, visited them and wrote about them in Drawing Down the Moon. But in, I think, 1975, they left St. Louis. Uh, Morning Glory and Oberon met in 73, and... In 74, they got married, so they had their 40th wedding anniversary just like less than a month before she died. And then they moved out to the West Coast because if you were in the 60s or 70s, if you were a hippie, you, want, you wanted to go live on the West Coast because that's where all the communes were and the weather and the lifestyle. So they moved out to the West Coast, and they ended up living on some land in Northern California, and they started their unicorn project. That's a... A, a central part of the book is that when they raised these unicorns and they sold them to the circus and then they went looking for mermaids with the money they got from the unicorns. So that's, that's a whole different story. But while they were doing all this, they were kind of out of touch with the pagan community. And then when they got back in touch with the pagan community again, things had really changed. Yes. A lot of the paganism at that point was involved around witchcraft, which wasn't the way things were when they started, but it was people like 
Starhawk and uh, uh, who, who else were some of, some of the other big witches then? Well, Starhawk had a big a lot to do with it. Uh, Pete Budapest Scott, was big yeah. Bad. Scott Cunningham. Yeah. Scott Cunningham wrote a book called uh, Wicca for the Solitary Practitioner. So a lot of people have become witches and Wiccans, which wasn't really their thing. Morning Glory and Oberon. So when they came back from the woods, they uh, started publishing the Green Egg again. Cause, and that's kind of when the Church of All Worlds got going again, was when they, they started publishing Green Egg as a full magazine, not a fanzine, but a real magazine. The magazine was sold in, on, in newsstands and in bookstores and, you know, through the mail. So that went from, like, the late 80s through the late 90s, I think. So this was right before the Internet. You know, so the Green Egg was kind of, like, helped keep people together until the Internet came about. And then when the Internet happened, print magazines didn't really, were really hit by that. So now Green Egg is around as a Internet zine. But I think they were really at their most influential in the 60s and 70s with the first fanzines, and then in the 90s with the magazine they were published. Well, yeah, I mean, when I when I had uh, Serpentine Music as a pagan music distribution business, I found a lot of the artists through the back pages, you know, the classified section of Green Egg, like you did before the Internet. It was always in the back of whatever magazine. You'd be able to right. set up a correspondence. And there were a lot of musicians with, a you know, a tape or a, even an LP back then, and that's how I found a lot of them. So that was how they spread their ideas, and there I, you know, the Green Egg was, there's, you know, it's, the history of this is kind of, you know, p different people tell it in different ways, but one way of looking at this is the Green Egg was the first magazine to publish an article about polyamory. That was their issue of, about the bouquet of lovers. So they weren't just talking about paganism, they were talking about polyamory, and all these, each month the Green Egg had a different theme. The Church of All Worlds, you know, the land they were living on up in Mendocino County, well, next to that land was some land that was owned by Gwydion Penduin, getting back to Gwydion again. When he died, he left his land to the Church of All Worlds. So that 55 acres of land in Mendocino County is still owned by the church, and now that it is a legally uh, authorized pagan burial ground, and that's where Morning Glory was buried last week. Right. Just to kind of put that, to you know, tie that in together, and they buried her in the ground, and they planted an apple tree in the earth above her. So that's, you know, she lived as a pagan, and she's buried as a pagan. Yeah. I mean, I thought this, I thought this was a really interesting story. The first person I knew that emailed me that he bought the book was a friend of mine back in Chicago, where I used to live. And I worked with him in the nightclub business, and he was a rock and roller. And, you know, rode a motorcycle. He wasn't pagan at all. He was like an Italian Catholic, right? But he was the first person I knew when the book came out a couple months ago that he bought it on Amazon because he knew me and he read it. And he really <laughs> liked it. I thought, this was cool, you know. This is what I want. I want people that aren't from this community to, like, read it and be entertained. I think it's a very entertaining book. It is an entertaining book. And, and really, anybody who's ever read the Whole Earth Catalog back in the day or, yeah. or you know, any of that kind of stew, this is the same, you're, you're right, it's the same uh, cultural stew pot that, that, you know, the Whole Earth, Stuart Brand, all that kind of stuff. Ken Kesey. Yeah, that whole, it's part of a lineage. And, and, and it is actually, I mean, partly because of the Green Egg, and Oberon's always been a prolific writer, it's a literary movement. You know, you can also tie it, tie Oberon and Morning Glory and the Church of All Worlds into this whole, you know, West Coast literary scene, which has always been very um, vibrant and uh, kind of a leader in sort of off um, off the beaten path subject matter and uh, theorizing social theory too so it's fascinating and, and I'm glad that you're sticking to your guns and keeping it you know straight up as a as an American story rather than just kind of get, going into the you know the pagan ghetto <laughs> that sounds terrible <laughs> scratch that oh wait this is live never mind <laughs> but you know what I mean I mean because I do think that this has some mainstream appeal um, certainly for people who are interested in new religious movements in general. Or just I mean, people trying to live their own lives, you know, and thinking for themselves. 
Yeah, Morning Glory and Oberon, there was a lot of controversy around them. Even, even within the small pagan community, a lot of people didn't approve of what they were doing. But, you know, they, they lived the way they wanted to live, and Morning Glory died and was buried the way she wanted to be. Uh, they, and that's that's the American way, isn't it? It's like, you know, you, you're in an individual. You don't let somebody else tell you what to do. You don't let the government think for you. You don't, you know, follow the rules. That, that, that was yeah. Absolutely. Uh, I've been talking to John Sulak, the author of the recently released The Wizard and the Witch, an oral history of Oberon Zell and Morning Glory. Um, John, let people know how to get in touch with you. The book is on for sale everywhere, Amazon. Every are you doing any appearances or any stuff coming up soon? Uh, well, we we had a book release event for in February, and then I went to Thailand, which is a very powerful, you know, spiritual experience for me, just because it's it's a non-Western country. I've never been away from like, you know, a Western civilization, and in something it, it was just completely new and really opened me up, but I'm not sure what we're, what we're going to do this summer, but it's on Amazon.com. Um, it's on, you know, eBay, you can, things like that. Um, probably the best thing to do is just go to Amazon and get it from there. If That's where my friend in Chicago got it. I was pretty impressed that, you know, he got it from Amazon before I even knew they were selling it, and hopefully some of my other friends are getting that, but I also hope that it reaches lots of other people, too. Getting back to what you said about the California, you know, lifestyle and the literary movement. I mean, Tom Wolfe wrote the book *The Electric Kool-Aid Acid Test* about Ken Kesey. And at that time, Ken Kesey was not that well known, but he just documented what they did and preserved it for the world. So now, anybody that wants to can pick up this book and read about Ken Kesey and Neil Casty, the Magic Bus. And there was a whole scene around Ken Kesey too. There was, yeah, the musical scene, the Grateful Dead. We're part of that scene, and the literary scene. You know, there are like, yeah, the beat poets and, uh, you know, uh, other, you know, journalists and writers were part of that scene too. And I hope this book comes across in the same way. It's like the Zells. They had writers and artists and people developing their own communities and lifestyles. They all kind of intersected around the Church of All Worlds and continue to to this day. So I hope this is a story that anybody interested in just how a community is formed and how people find their own place in the world, you know, can get something from this book. Well, John, thank you so much for devoting so many years and just so much hard work to this book and I hope it finds its audience. I hope it's really successful and and I hope you get to write about your own life very soon. Well, can I just throw in one last thing? Yes. The best thing that's come out of this book is in the last couple of years when I had to really, basically I spent like two years just re-editing the book because it was so long and there were so many different things going on. This is when I got involved in the relationship that I'm in now. So I'd like to thank my partner, Elisa, for helping me get through this. And we really kind of like, you know, formed our relationship and our romance while, you know, this book was being completed. So I couldn't have completed the book without her. And I'll always... Whatever else happens with this book, I'll be glad I was I did the book because it really allowed me to get to know Elisa. So thank you, Elisa. And thank you, Ann Hill, for this interview. You bet. You bet. Always a pleasure, John. I'll talk to you soon. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>